All right, it is 7.05, so let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the fourth and final webinar of our fall 2016 series. Thank you so much for coming. This webinar will be presented by Rachel Narducci, who works as a fossil preparator and collections assistant at the Florida Museum of Natural History. I'm Eleanor Gardner. If you haven't joined us for a webinar before, please know that this is part of a series that we've offered in partnership with the Paleontological Society, and it has been facilitated via iDigBio's Adobe Connect platform. Although this is our last webinar for fall 2016, you should please plan to join us for the spring of 2017 for our next webinar series, which will be promoting women in paleontology. The first webinar will take place on January 25th, and the speaker will be Tara Lepore of the Web Schools and the Raymond Alf Museum of Paleontology. And it should be a fantastic webinar uh, session, so please be sure to put that on your calendar. You can learn more about our webinar series and the fossil project in general at www.myfossil.org. And we invite everyone here, if you haven't already, to sign up and participate in the My Fossil community. So before we get started, just a bit of housekeeping. This webinar should end no later than 8 p.m. Eastern time. And the way we intend for this to work is that Rachel will speak for about 30 minutes, after which we will open it up for discussion and questions. So we therefore encourage you to take notes and type your questions in the chat box that's in the lower right-hand corner um, in order to facilitate question and answer uh, after the presentation. No one except for the presenter and myself have active microphones. So if you can hear us and see the PowerPoint, you're good to go. If you're having any technical problems, please try exiting the program and then re-entering Adobe Connect. Or you can also type in the chat box um, to receive technical support from our team. Also, please don't forget to take the short survey after the webinar ends. It's really important for us for reporting purposes to our funding agency, which is the National Science Foundation. So we truly appreciate your time in taking the survey after the webinar. As I mentioned before, you may type questions and comments in the chat box at any time during the webinar, but please know that the speaker won't address your questions until the Q&A time. This webinar is being recorded, and both the recording and Rachel's presentation will be made available under the resources section on myfossil.org, so you can access it at a later time. Lastly, many of you know that by attending or watching recordings of all four webinars, you can receive a certificate of completion. In order to earn the certificate, or for any educators who are currently earning continuing education units, you must be signed into the webinar with your full name, remain and participate for the entire hour, and be a member of the MyFossil community. Um, since this is our last webinar, I just want to let everybody know that over the coming weeks, I will be compiling a list of names of people who earned the webinar certificate, and I'll be in touch individually about distributing the certificates via email. If you have any questions or you think that you've been left off the list inadvertently, please contact me at the email address that's listed in the webinar notes section. And so with that, let's turn it over to Rachel to talk to us about fossil preparation. Rachel? Well, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, so the purpose and goals of tonight's webinar is to explain laboratory preparation techniques for vertebrate and invertebrate fossils, and to also go over some proper storage and cataloging techniques for these fossils. The intended outcome is for you, the viewers, to be able to take these techniques home and incorporate them into your own collections. So I just want to start with saying that every single preparation project is different. And it really comes down to the most important question, which is what is the desired outcome? How do you want this fossil to end up? Do you just need to stabilize it enough to store it away? Do you need it to look really pretty so that it can be put on display? Or will it be used in research purposes where you might need to be able to take measurements or see certain features, such as muscle attachments. 
And then going hand in hand with this question is how much time do you have? Um, and all of this just depends on what condition the specimen is in. If it's very broken or fragmented or encased in hard rock, it could take months to prepare. So depending on the situation, fossil preparation can be very time consuming. And you typically want to begin with the least invasive methods first. Start small and then increase the strength accordingly. So going back to Bruce's webinar about field notes, the scientific value of a specimen drops dramatically without field data. So if it was able to make it from the field all the way back to the lab with all of its information, it is now up to you to keep all of that information with it. So as you are preparing, you need to label and organize all of the matrix that you remove, any fragments that fall off while you are preparing the specimen, and then any other specimens that are discovered during the process. So I usually just put all of these in separate boxes with separate labels. Also, something to consider is that preparation usually involves liquids, which can mean spills, and that means ruined labels, and then that means lost data, which, of course, we do not want. So it's important to always use a pencil. Pens or markers might bleed or smudge, especially over time, so you won't be able to read the label anymore. And it's also best to use thicker paper, like cardstock, because if regular paper gets wet, it might tear or erase the writing. And honestly, in the lab, if a specimen is NFD, which means it has no field data, it probably will not even get prepared, and it's just going to be tossed into the giveaway pile. So starting with the least invasive methods first, we have this compressed air duster can, which is good for removing dust from irregular surfaces like limestone, uh, soft and stiff bristle paint brushes, your own fingernails, various dental tools. Uh, I don't actually know if this is true, but I wonder if you could just ask a dentist for their old tools. Um, and in the picture, the flat spatula-like tools are really good for working with clays. And the next and more invasive method would be to use an air abrasion unit or sand blaster. This is kind of like the air duster can, but it's obviously way more powerful because it uses compressed air to blow out some type of sand to abrade matrix from specimens. So if you look at the two pictures on the bottom of the slide, you can see that the specimen goes into the box and then you slide your hands through the holes and inside of the box is a little hose that shoots out the air and the sandy material and then you control this with a foot pedal. And you have to be careful with these because they can damage the specimen or even your hands if you linger in one spot for too long. And an example of when to use this is for something like the pitting in this caiman skull or on the surface of echinoids like sea biscuits. So moving on to carbide tools, these are pretty awesome and really sturdy and I use them all of the time in both vertebrate and invertebrate fossil preparation. You typically have to shape these before they can be used for fossil preparation. So we try to shape them so that they have this thin, skewed, diamond type of a cross section. Uh, we start by getting a rough shape with a metal bench grinder like the one in the picture, and then we use these diamond sharpening stones under some type of magnification. These stones go from coarse to fine to extra fine, and that allows you to get the sharpest, finest edge possible. But you don't want the tool to come to a sharp point at the tip, because it should be more rounded and smooth while the edges are sharp. And a quick example of when to use a carbide tool is on something like this musk deer astragalus from the Panama Canal. So on this specimen, I would probably start with the medium tool, but then end up using the small. And I also forgot to add a scale bar into this picture, but the, each of the tools is about three inches long. So the next preparation method I'm going to discuss involves pneumatic tools. 
These are hooked up to an air compressor and then the tips rotate really quickly which blasts the matrix away from the fossil. In invertebrates and vertebrates we purchase all of these types of tools from paleotools.com uh, which are designed specifically for use on fossils. And these tools increase in strength from the MicroJack 1, which is for really delicate fossils, all the way up to the Mighty Jack, which is the most powerful option. And that's best to use on huge dinosaur fossils in hard rock. So I've never had to use anything this powerful from any fossils from Florida. Um, and to operate these, you need at least a small air compressor. So one that plugs into a wall outlet would be fine, but it must operate at a minimum of 100 pounds per square inch. Uh, you should also use these tools under some sort of magnification so that you can actually see what you're doing. And you will need oil to occasionally lubricate the stylus and O-ring. Uh, so if you're wondering which one you should buy, because buying more than one could be really expensive, uh, the truth is that it depends on your specific project, so it always depends on the specific project. Um, it would be most beneficial to those who need to work on a lot of one type of fossil in one type of matrix. I will say that the most commonly used tool in the vertebrate and invertebrate labs is the MicroJack 4. However, we don't have the three or the five, so maybe we would use one of those more often if we had them. And the picture in the lower left of this slide is a microjack four being used to prepare a stone crab out of a limestone block. And this image is also looking through a magnifying lamp, which I will talk about in a later slide. Um, so, magnification, oh, I guess I lost my paper for that. Anyway, the headband magnifier is the cheapest option, and they usually have lights built in, so that gives you the freedom to just work wherever you want. Um, and the magnifying lamps are really great, too. Some clamp onto the table, while others stand on the floor and they have a gooseneck. Uh, with invertebrate fossil prep, this type of lamp is what I most often use. Uh, and then with vertebrate fossil prep, we use these stereo dissecting microscopes on a boom arm. So the boom arm is really necessary because we work on a lot of specimens that are different sizes. Uh, and these are pretty expensive, but they're really necessary for some types of fossil preparation, including most micro preparation, if not all. And then we also use a surgical microscope, which gives you even more flexibility in movement. Uh, these are best for preparing very large specimens or being able to view different angles of a specimen rather than just the top-down view, which is what you would get with the stereo dissecting scope. So moving on to liquids that you can use for fossil prep. Water is good for most things. It helps you remove almost any type of matrix, and it softens clays. Uh, just like a side note, if you are working with clays, you seriously need to keep the matrix and specimen as damp as possible, because it will crack if it dries out. And you can do this by uh, wrapping it up in plastic. And then uh, you can also use water for screen washing to reverse or dilute certain types of glues, bleach, and formic acid. And it's easy to dispose of. So you can just pour it down the drain or throw it out in the grass. Um, acetone and isopropyl alcohol are good for fragile specimens because they evaporate so quickly. And they are also what we use to dilute our most commonly used glues, which I will talk about in a later slide. And last is the formic acid, which can be a bit dangerous, but it's highly effective on calcium carbonate, also known as limestone. And a downside with the formic acid is that it is considered a hazardous waste, and it needs to be disposed of properly. So,
So uh, when we use the formic acid method, we call it an acid bath. And we use 7% formic acid diluted with water. And we also add tribasic calcium phosphate as a buffer. So here is a marine mammal vertebra in a limestone matrix. We coated the specimen with PVA, which I will also be talking about in a later slide. And then we place it in a plastic container. So we pour the acid enough to cover the limestone and it will begin bubbling, which means it is reacting. And then you cover this loosely with a lid. And you should wait until it stops reacting, which was about two hours for this example, and then remove the specimen with rubber gloves. We pour the acid into a container in the satellite accumulation area, um, which is something that we are required to have in the lab. And we are also required to take a hazardous waste training once a year so that we are able to handle these substances. And then you must flush the specimen and container for double the amount of time of the run. So since we ran it for two hours, we must flush it for four hours. With con After four hours, it is considered safe to touch with bare hands. So I know a lot of people have been asking questions about glues. There is a very important chart on this slide. You probably can't read anything because it's so small. But I have a link to a PDF of this chart. And then under that link is another link with a description of the glues that are on the chart. So this chart is provided by the Society for the Preservation of Natural History Collections and has every detail you need to know about glues for fossil preparation. So this really is the go-to chart for info on glues. Um, and this might be surprising, but one of the glues that we most often use is good old Elmer's School Glue, or PVA, which stands for polyvinyl acetate. It's cheap, easy to get, and it works. So um, mixing the PVA with acetone is what we use to coat the marine mammal vertebra in the previous acid bath slide. And you can also dilute the regular Elmer's glue with a lot of water and let that seep into clay-rich fossils. The glue that we most commonly use in both vertebrate and invertebrate fossil prep is Paraloid B72. This is a plastic-based glue that comes as little beads that you can mix with acetone or the isopropyl alcohol. And we have found that the acetone mixture is better for use in the lab because it hardens more quickly, while the alcohol mixture is better in the field because it reacts with the heat and humidity better. And then you can make thick or thin concentrations of this. Thinner is typically better overall because it can seep into the fossil rather than just coating the surface. And a thick concentration is good for gluing things back together, like this gomphothere tusk that I have propped up in a sandbox. Uh, with really thin invertebrates, like crab carapaces or some bivalves, you want to pat a super thin mixture of the B72 onto the specimen rather than painting it on. Because if you do that, it will leave streak marks, and it might not absorb evenly into the specimen. And an eyedropper is good to use for really porous bone, like skulls, where you just keep adding the B72 until the specimen won't take anymore. So this next slide has glues that provide a stronger hold, but are harder or nearly impossible to reverse. Cyanoacrylate is super glue. You can have thick or thin concentrations of this. Thin is good for microfossils, where you could just use a drop on the tip of a pin for a tiny rodent tooth or something like that. And just a bonus tip, if you exhale or blow hot breath, the super glue dries a lot more quickly. Five minute epoxy is something that you can buy from a craft store for about $20. It comes as a resin and hardener, and this is a one to one ratio. So you pour the same size dot of each one and then mix them together really well and glue your specimen, and then it will set up in about five minutes. The sculpting putty is similar to this, and it has the same one to one ratio. 
but it actually creates a clay-like substance, which is good for filling large gaps in specimens and to hold them back together. I have a picture of the jaws from a giant armadillo where you can see that the gray areas are actually this sculpting putty, and this is what is holding all the fragments of the jaws together. And I've also used hot glue guns for creating ethafoam cradles and different types of specimen storage. I know Deva talked about this in the last webinar, but a lot of what you prepare in the lab are the plaster jackets that are returned from the field. So plaster jackets are created by digging around to put the, the specimen up on a pedestal and then mixing plaster of Paris with water and using burlap strips or just plaster bandages. Whichever one you choose typically depends on the size and weight of the plaster jacket. And once you get these back to the lab, some things to help you prepare them include sandbags to prop up the jacket or keep it from rocking, water bottles to soften the plaster, tin snips, razors, and box cutters to cut down the plaster as you work through the jacket, and having a sheet of plastic handy is helpful to retain the moisture in the matrix, and this is extra important for clays. It's important to understand that plaster jackets, flip jackets, clamshells, and cradles all require the same techniques and materials to create. So if you can make one of them, you can make all of them. Uh, here's just a little case study where you can see the original jacket propped up with sandbags. And the picture below that shows how the jacket has been completely prepared and cut down to the specimen. And then now you can make a flip jacket to work on the other side of the specimen which is the picture in the middle. And then you create a cradle, which is the final resting place for the specimen. So this cradle was lined with felt over the plaster, and the specimen is actually stable enough that you could pick it up and move it around to view the other side. Sometimes you will want to spend the time to rebuild certain specimens, especially if they will go on display. And this can be difficult because fossils being in the ground for so long can change shape over time and the pieces do not always fit back together very well. So here's an example of a really complex jacket that I worked on. Uh, there's a giant armadillo skull with some of its limb bones and osteoderms of the carapace. And this is next to a snapping turtle shell, which is next to and kind of on top of a slider turtle shell. So with this example, we took pictures, labeled the individual bones using Photoshop, and then put all this information into an Excel spreadsheet, removed and cleaned the individual fossils, and then labeled each one. So now we have a digital copy of what it all originally looked like, but also clean fragments that are ready to be pieced together. Um, also, I drew the outline of each head shield osteoderm as I removed them to use as sort of a cheat sheet when I was rebuilding the head shield. So the picture on the left is the rebuilt head shield with the little codes written on the back of each osteoderm. The picture on the right is the slider turtle carapace and plastron rebuilt. And unfortunately, the snapping turtle was not rebuilt. The amount of time just wouldn't have been worth the effort. Plus, you can still see most of the important features just with leaving it in its original jacket. So moving on to making a mold, you can have one part molds, two part, all the way up to 13 or so. And this is especially if you're working on like huge dinosaurs or really complex fossils. The most common are probably the two-part molds, and I'll go over a case study of one. This is a peccary astragalus from the Belgrade Quarry in North Carolina. Uh, you first push the specimen into clay to create a seam line. You also need to create a clay pore spout, and just think about this whole process in reverse. So, the specimen and pore spout will just be empty spaces in the final mold. And then you begin to build up walls. 
Uh, we use a slab roller like the one in the picture, but you could also just use a rolling pin. And I pushed round indents into the clay around the base with the opposite end of a paintbrush to help the final mold lock together. And I also pushed letter stamps into the clay wall, which will actually produce a label on the final mold. And then you'll want to use rounded tools to seal all of the cracks in the clay, and then you pour the mold. So we use Smooth On Mold Star 15, which is a silicone rubber. And this is kind of like mixing the epoxy, where it has the two different parts that react with each other. Um, you allow this to set up overnight. And on the bottom of the slide, I added a link to the website where you can buy this stuff. Um, or there's also a video to see how to use it. Now you remove the clay, but do not move the specimen. You pretty much don't even want to touch the specimen. It needs to stay in the original position so that you can get a perfect cast in the end. And then you'll want to paint a layer of the PVA with acetone on the mold around the specimen so that when you pour the next side of the mold, it doesn't just stick together and trap the specimen inside. And don't forget to create a new clay pour spout, and then rebuild up the walls, seal all the cracks like you did before the first pour, and now pour the next side of the mold and allow that to set up overnight. So now you have a completed two-part mold, and you can remove the specimen and the clay and you might want to try to chip away some of the PVA layer so the mold is now ready for the cast to be poured into it for casting specimens we use smooth cast which is from the same company as the mold making material and this is a urethane plastic so these also have a two-part mixture, and we place it in a vacuum chamber in order to reduce bubbles. If the material comes out looking like the picture in the upper middle, this means it has gone bad and it just needs to be thrown away. There's just nothing you can do to fix it. Um, you then put them all together, sometimes with rubber bands but not too tight, and then pour the cast. It's best to sort of apply pressure to the edges of the mold as you are pouring the cast to release any trapped air bubbles, so kind of like you are burping the mold. And as the cast sets up, it will actually heat up and begin to turn white for this particular product. And I managed to not get a picture of this cast before we painted it, but here is a grumpy little turtle to show what it would have looked like. And then you can paint the cast to look like the original specimen. Um, and many of you probably recognize this image. Uh, this can be really beneficial for educational purposes where you could like let children handle it and not worry as much about it getting broken, or to send through the mail for research purposes rather than the original specimen. Moving on to the silicone peel. Uh, so we use the same smooth on silicone rubber that we used to create the mold in the previous slides. It's also similar in that you build up clay walls, pour the silicone, and then let it set up overnight. Uh, silicone peels are probably most commonly used for external molds of invertebrates. But these pictures show an example of a situation where a visiting researcher didn't have enough time to gather all of the data that he needed while he was here. So we created this peel on the Paige Ladson mammoth tusk and sent it to him through the mail. So from this peel, he was actually able to determine what tools were used by early humans in Florida on this tusk, which is kind of awesome. Um, rock saws can be really important for minimizing space and weight requirements in a collection or separating out specimens if there are like three different ones on one rock. The Invertebrate Paleontology Collection at the Florida Museum has 6.5 million specimens, not including the microfossils, so we really need to optimize every last space that we have available to us. 
So in the picture to the left, you can see an external mold of a gastropod and the silicone peel that goes with it, but the rock around it is just unnecessary and can easily be removed with the rock saw. So with fossil preparation, there is not one right way to reach a desired outcome. You can be totally creative. If it works, then it works. But with cataloging specimens, it is better to follow a normal set of standards, kind of like a universal code. We typically use all caps and try to write the numbers like those in the picture. Uh, you'll want to use archival ink. Rapidographs are inkier and better for writing on irregular surfaces. While micron pens are better for writing on smooth surfaces or for writing on really small specimens. Uh, to help the pens write more smoothly, specifically the rapidograph, we will first paint a line of this white gesso and allow that to dry. An idea to deal with really small specimens is push a pen through a cork and then glue the specimen to the pen and then you could just write the catalog number on the bottom of the cork. I think most people don't realize how important properly storing your fossils can actually be, um, especially if you want to pass your collection on to others in the future. You really need to use acid-free paper and trays and boxes, uh, cotton, bubble wrap, vials, gel caps, and or zip top bags, polyethylene foams like ethafoam, uh, which is what I use to make the tusk holder in the picture to the right plaster bandages, plaster and burlap cradles. Uh, we use metal, but glass cabinets are fine too. And you need to try to keep your collection climate controlled. Like humidity is not your friend at all. Uh, you do not want to use practically any type of woods to store your specimens. They can produce harmful vapors unless they are like super properly sealed. And you don't want to use styrofoam, cardboard, or direct lighting. Uh, some vertebrate specimens can get pyrite disease from exposure to too much moisture and this turns the fossils to pyrite and breaks it down um, over time. And we recently checked out an amateur's collection who had this huge shed with a window AC unit that he didn't run all the time and he was storing the specimens in wood cabinets. So. Unfortunately, almost all of his invertebrates had Bynesian decay or Bynes disease, which looks like a white powdery mold growth. Uh, there is no way to fix or reverse this decay, so all of his fossils, with all of the field data of course, will just decay over time and no longer exist. So it's a pretty big deal. And I also put a link to some of the more detailed information about this on the bottom of the slide. Uh, so people often ask if there is some fossil prep book that they can buy and as far as I know the best book for vert paleo prep is this vertebrate paleontological techniques volume one. The price just keeps going up though and it's currently at 103 on Amazon and I'm really regretting not buying this three years ago when it was at $60 uh, but all well, the American Museum of Natural History has this cool paleo portal with a ton of information about fossil prep and the Florida Museum also has an amateur collector webpage with a lot of info and seriously if you have any specific questions or think of any questions after the webinar that you didn't get to ask please feel free to ask me through my fossil and I'm just at R Narducci so Preparators are always experimenting with trial and error in fossil preparation. There is not one correct way to reach a desired outcome, and we're usually on a budget trying to find the most cost-effective preparation methods. So you can prepare specimens with the cheapest and least invasive methods. It just typically costs more of your time. So get creative. Don't feel like you have to follow a set of guidelines or buy any expensive equipment. And as I was creating this presentation, I realized there was so much more information that I wanted to share with you all that I just wouldn't be able to fit into these 30 to 35 minutes. So I hope I covered at least the basics of everything enough. 
and that you are leaving with a greater understanding of fossil preparation than what you came in with. And then maybe we can delve further into some of these topics in the future. So I hope you've enjoyed this webinar, and thank you so much for attending. Great. Thank you so very much, Rachel. This has been wonderful, the wealth of information that you've shared with us and all of the resources as well. I'm sure that everybody uh, really appreciates that. Um, at this time, we're going to open it up for Q&A. And um, so I know that folks have been typing throughout the webinar. Um, so we have a, a list of questions that we're going to go ahead and start with. Um, the first question is actually coming from one of our Facebook followers. Uh, Dr. Benjamin um, Dottillo, he asked this a little while ago, he wanted to know what's an example of a time when you would not want to prep out a fossil? Okay, so to think about that question, you really have to think about the fact that that fossil has been surrounded by that matrix for a very long time, like millions of years. So removing any of that surrounding matrix that has been protecting it is going to make the fossil less stable. So that kind of brings you back to the first slide where what is the end game for this fossil and how much time do you have? Um, so sometimes in vertebrate paleontology, we will purposely leave ribs of really large creatures like mammoths or something uh, broken in pieces. Because if we glue them back together, that's just going to be way too large to fit into the collection. And then micro CT scanning is becoming pretty popular. So uh, if you have like a block of rock that you know something is in, you can see like a little bit of it, you can micro CT scan it and then actually digitally prepare it and remove the matrix from the specimen. Great. Thank you. Um, another question that came up was, uh, folks were curious how long you've been working in the prep lab at the museum here. Uh, I've been working there for about four years now, I guess. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. um, another question was from George uh, Powell. He was curious, where does the wastewater from when you're rinsing after um, doing the formic acid uh, bath, where does that water go? Like, do you also have to dispose of that carefully? Uh, so that water can just go straight down the drain. The actual formic acid itself is what we have to pour into the satellite accumulation area. But just as it's rinsing, it's just all rinsing through this tub and going down the drain. Gotcha. OK. Um, another question, I believe, was from Linda McCall. She had been to another um, conference that had said not to use Elmer's glue. And so she was curious if there was a consensus on when you should use Elmer's glue or not at all, or how that works. Well, I don't know. I think I've heard something about that, too. But I guess Elmer's glue specifically, you know, it's like a brand. And I don't know if they add anything to it. So PVA, the polyvinyl acetate, is actually what you want to use. Um, and that is the main ingredient in Elmer's glue. So they might have a point if, um, if there are like added ingredients that might be bad for the fossils, but I don't really know any more about it than that. OK, no problem. Um, another question we got was when you mentioned um, sandbags. And so some folks were curious where you would get sandbags or where you would get materials for making large or small sandbags. Um, I guess I don't really know exactly where we buy the materials, but you can just use white play sand. Uh, you can probably get that at like Home Depot or something. And then we just use cloth bags, just with a tie string. And we'll usually double it up so that sand doesn't fall out of one end. Um, great. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> no problem. That's great. Um, another question was, um, do the labels on the osteoderms cover significant portions of the fossil? This is in reference to that image um, where I think you had some images which were showing Photoshop and then others that weren't. Yeah. Um, so when we actually write on the specimens, you do always want to try to write the like catalog number 
on an area that isn't as important. So on all of those osteoderms, we wrote it on the back side of the osteoderm, uh, away from any of the edges. So that really doesn't block out any of the features. Awesome. And uh, like with bivalves and invertebrates and stuff, you also you'd want to stay away from like the hinge line. Uh, Okay, awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, another question came from, I believe, Julie. Um, she was asking, are Riker boxes okay for storage? This, I believe, was in reference to your um, mentioning that wood would be bad. So I don't know what those are, <laughs> but I would be very happy to look into that and um, I could post something about it on my fossil, for sure. That would be great. Um, I don't know if this will help you. Riker boxes are usually made of cardboard and cotton. Oh, okay. Well, cardboard is kind kind of iffy because sometimes it like produces the acid that can mess up the fossils, but cotton is fine to use. Okay. And I, I would love to see further discussion of that. Um, yeah. On well. Okay, so we have more questions coming in. This is awesome. Um, <laughs> question is, how are the tusks prepped? Um, many I've worked with have surface flaking. So do you... Tusks. Tusks, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, do you coat them with anything? Um... Yes, so it kind of depends. Like there were some that I most recently worked on that were just covered in this black material and we used the acetone, you know, rather than water to scrape that off and then we coated it with a thin concentration of the B72. If the tusk is like really flaky so that you can't even touch it, it would be best to just leave it where it is, don't touch it, and use an eyedropper and drip a really thin coating of the B72 onto the tusk. Okay. And then just let that harden up. Okay. Awesome. Uh, kind of jumping back to one of the first questions that we got um, in this session was from Lynn Moore. She was curious, when inverts are graham cracker soft, how can you stabilize them? Uh, so that's kind of like the same thing with the eyedropper. Like if you can't even use a paintbrush on it because it's that soft, I have often um, just used an eyedropper to drip the really thin B72 and then just don't touch it for like an hour. Um, and I mean, I guess if you're collecting it and you wrap it up in the tissue paper, and you just you can tell that it's all crumbly inside of the tissue paper you can just cut that away and expose a tiny amount of it drip the B72 and then just keep cutting away to expose more and let it just keep hardening gotcha great thank you um, another question we got mm -hmm. asks without access to an air scribe do you have suggestions for using something like maybe a Dremel tool so I know that we have a Dremel tool in the lab. I haven't actually used it because we do have the air scribes, but I'm sure that that would be fine. I don't know if they create more vibration than the air scribes. That would, that would be the worry with using them. Um, but I think if you try it and it works, then that's awesome. Um, another question is, how do you get into fossil prep if you don't live in a fossil-rich area? Um, hmm. I guess, I don't know, maybe if you live by a museum and you could go volunteer in it or something. Um, I guess that doesn't really help if you're not living in a very fossil-rich area. Um, that's a good, that's a yeah. good answer. And we can also um, have lots of participation from others on the MyFossil website as well to add ideas to that. 
Okay. Um, another question that we had was, um, uh, oh, oh, can you ask a dental office for old dental tools? Do you know if they would give them to you? <laughs> well, I know that in the past that was fine, and that's where most of our tools came from. I just don't know if you can still do that now. I'm not 100% sure. I would try it and just see what they say, but I don't completely know. I know that um, Kyle from the Dry Dredger shared earlier that uh, you can often get uh, dental tools at, um, I believe, like fairs and flea, market. and flea markets and things like that. Oh, so okay. that a way to, to reach those kinds of tools. Okay, um, another question we have is, after you remove matrix, do you still keep the fossil moist to prevent cracking? No, um, pretty much, like once you remove all of the matrix, what I'll do is just let the fossil dry out, like maybe even overnight and then I'll coat it with glue and once it's coated with the glue then it's perfectly fine and you just don't even want to get it wet again and at that point you can just keep it dry from that point on. Okay, excellent. Uh, another question we have here is where do I find a magnifying light with a high diopter? Mm. I don't know the answer to that one right off of the top of my head either, but that is something I could definitely look into and post on my fossil. Okay, awesome. Um, let's see. Another question we have is, are there any chemical techniques for preparing fossils with pyrite disease? Well, I don't know really because we had some fossils that had pyrite disease and we definitely prepared them with only acetone so that it would evaporate really quickly like we, our hands did, couldn't even be wet we had to use gloves to um, work with them but uh, I don't think there's really any way to reverse it we did use B72 and I mean it would the fossil it would take a really long time to break down so for now it's fine but I guess I don't really know of any specific chemical chemicals that you could use. Okay, great. Um, another question is, um, where do you get the archival boxes and trays? So somebody else buys them. <laughs> so I'm not completely sure, but. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, maybe we could talk to Art or whomever at yeah. the museum or, um, purchases those, and we can post that information on my fossil. Yeah, I could, I could definitely find that out very easily, and probably even have a link to the website that they order it from. Ooh, awesome! Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we have another question. I believe this one was from Linda. She says, "I have a fossil crab that might have some organics preserved, so I am worried of doing." Um, any abrasive actions on it? Are there? Do you have any ideas? Um, I I think I'd have to see what it looks like to really give you um, specific help with that. And you, if you did want to send me a picture, I would definitely be glad to help. Um, but I would probably just try to harden it up with something like B seventy two. And um, yeah, I think I'd have to see a picture to really tell you what would be the best option. Okay, yeah, I think that um, that would be a great thing to do within the fossil prep forum on my fossil. So yeah, that can be um, a conversation to happen there. All right, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, I believe Sherry wanted to know, what was your training before you started working in the prep lab? So um, I got my BA in geology and anthropology at the University of Florida. And during that time, I had been volunteering in the lab. 
but it didn't start off with any other training than just that. So um, you could just volunteer in a museum, uh, do the fossil prep at home. You, def you don't really have to have any specific type of training. Would you recommend um, that people either attend fossil prep conferences if they can do that? Do you know if those would be opened to people who were just learning? Yeah, definitely if you are able to, um, attending any of those types of meetings would be really helpful. And there's one coming up, it's the Fossil Preparation and Collection Symposium. Uh, but that's not until like April of next year, and that's in Austin, Texas. And they do they try to keep the registration fees pretty low, um, like thirty dollars or something. I'm not really sure. And they will also provide workshops sometimes. I know last year the workshop was about how to make molds, um, how to mold and cast. So those would be really helpful if you are able to attend them. Uh, another question we have is, can you use B72 on porous fossils like whale verts? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's when you would want to use the thin concentration and just drip it. You really want to try to drip it down into the cracks if there are any cracks, rather than just letting it like slide off of the surface. And that's a good example of when you would want to just keep feeding the B72 in until it just seems like it won't take anymore. And that will completely harden it up and be really helpful. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, another question I saw come through, is there a way to keep foam used for fossil storage from turning yellow? Um, I actually saw that one come up and I don't know but that's another one that I would definitely like to look up and see because I've seen that yellow, uh, the yellow foam too, so I will look into that. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much. I think that that's just about all of the questions that we had um, come through. This has been an amazing webinar. We really thank you um, for your time and sharing all of this information with us. Um, since we're right about on time here, please, everyone, make sure that you take the um, survey. You can click on the link directly from the uh, presentation there. It's also posted in the webinar notes section. Um, and don't forget that uh, you should mark your calendars for January 25th when our second series begins um, promoting women in paleontology. So again, thank you, thank you to everybody for coming. Please check us out at myfossil.org. And uh, I hope that everyone has a very happy holiday season. Thanks. <laughs>